Audiobookie presents The Labours of Hercules. Three short stories by Thomas Bullfinch, read by Nigel Cairn. But first, please be sure to like, subscribe and share our channel. Your support helps us to breathe new life into some of the best stories ever written. Thank you, really. If you're an author who would like to make your words come alive, let us know at audiobookie.co. We'd love to work with you. And now, without further ado, our feature presentation. Chapter 1. Hercules Hercules was the son of Jupiter and Alcmena. As Juno was always hostile to the offspring of her husband by mortal mothers, she declared war against Hercules from his birth. She sent two serpents to destroy him as he lay in his cradle, but the precocious infant strangled them with his own hands. He was, however, by the arts of Juno rendered subject to Eurystheus and compelled to perform all his commands. Eurystheus enjoined upon him a succession of desperate adventures, which are called the Twelve Labours of Hercules. The first was the fight with the Nemean lion. The valley of Nemea was infested by a terrible lion. Eurystheus ordered Hercules to bring him the skin of this monster. After using in vain his club and arrows against the lion, Hercules strangled the animal with his hands. He returned carrying the dead lion on his shoulder. But Eurystheus was so frightened at the sight of it, and at this proof of the prodigious strength of the hero, that he ordered him to deliver the account of his exploits in future outside the town. His next labour was the slaughter of the Hydra. This monster ravaged the country of Argos and dwelt in a swamp near the well of Amimone. This well had been discovered by Amimone when the country was suffering from drought, and the story was that Neptune, who loved her, had permitted her to touch the rock with his trident, and a spring of three outlets burst forth. Here the Hydra took up his position, and Hercules was sent to destroy him. The Hydra had nine heads, of which the middle one was immortal. Hercules struck off its heads with his club, but in the place of the head knocked off, two new ones grew forth each time. At length, with the assistance of his faithful servant, Iolaus, he burned away the heads of the Hydra and buried the ninth or immortal one under a huge rock. Another labour was the cleaning of the Orgean stables. Augeas, king of Elis, had a herd of three thousand oxen, whose stalls had not been cleansed for thirty years. Hercules brought the rivers Alpheus and Peneus through them and cleansed them thoroughly in one day. His next labour was of a more delicate kind. Admeta, the daughter of Eurystheus, longed to obtain the girdle of the queen of the Amazons, and Eurystheus ordered Hercules to go and get it. The Amazons were a nation of women. They were very warlike and held several flourishing cities. It was their custom to bring up only the female children. The boys were either sent away to the neighbouring nations or put to death. Hercules was accompanied by a number of volunteers, and after various adventures at last reached the country of the Amazons. Hippolyta, the queen, received him kindly and consented to yield him her girdle, but Juno, taking the form of an Amazon, went and persuaded the rest that the strangers were carrying off their queen. They instantly armed and came in great numbers down to the ship. Hercules, thinking that Hippolyta had acted treacherously, slew her, and taking her girdle, made sail homewards. Another task enjoined him, was to bring to Eurystheus the oxen of Gerion, a monster with three bodies who dwelt in the island Erythia, the Red, so called because it lay at the west, under the rays of the setting sun. This description is thought to apply to Spain, of which Gerion was king. After traversing various countries, Hercules reached at length the frontiers of Libya and Europe, where he raised the two mountains of Calpe and Abela, as monuments of his progress, or, according to another account, rent one mountain into two and left half on each side, forming the Straits of Gibraltar, the two mountains being called the Pillars of Hercules. The oxen were guarded by the giant Eurytion and his two-headed dog, but Hercules killed the giant and his dog and brought away the oxen in safety to Eurystheus. The most difficult labour of all was getting the golden apples of the Hesperides, for Hercules did not know where to find them. These were the apples which Juno had received at her wedding from the goddess of the earth, and which she had entrusted to the keeping of the daughters of Hesperus, assisted by a watchful dragon. 
After various adventures, Hercules arrived at Mount Atlas in Africa. Atlas was one of the titans who had warred against the gods, and after they were subdued, Atlas was condemned to bear on his shoulders the weight of the heavens. He was the father of the Hesperides, and Hercules thought, might, if anyone could, find the apples and bring them to him. But how to send Atlas away from his post, or bear up the heavens while he was gone? Hercules took the burden on his own shoulders and sent Atlas to seek the apples. He returned with them, and though somewhat reluctantly took his burden upon his shoulders again, and let Hercules return with the apples to Eurystheus. A celebrated exploit of Hercules was his victory over Antaeus. Antaeus, the son of Terra the Earth, was a mighty giant and wrestler, whose strength was invincible so long as he remained in contact with his mother Earth. He compelled all strangers who came to his country to wrestle with him, on condition that if conquered, as they all were, they should be put to death. Hercules encountered him, and finding that it was of no avail to throw him, for he always rose with renewed strength from every fall, he lifted him up from the earth and strangled him in the air. Cacus was a huge giant, who inhabited a cave on Mount Aventine and plundered the surrounding country. When Hercules was driving home the oxen of Geryon, Cacus stole part of the cattle while the hero slept. That their footprints might not serve to show where they had been driven, he dragged them backward by their tails to his cave. So their tracks all seemed to show that they had gone in the opposite direction. Hercules was deceived by this stratagem and would have failed to find his oxen if it had not happened that in driving the remainder of the herd past the cave where the stolen ones were concealed, those within began to low and were thus discovered. Cacus was slain by Hercules. The last exploit we shall record was bringing Cerberus from the lower world. Hercules descended into Hades, accompanied by Mercury and Minerva. He obtained permission from Pluto to carry Cerberus to the upper air, provided he could do it without the use of weapons. And in spite of the monsters struggling, he seized him, held him fast, and carried him to Eurystheus, and afterwards brought him back again. When he was in Hades, he obtained the liberty of Theseus, his admirer and imitator, who had been detained a prisoner there for an unsuccessful attempt to carry off Proserpine. Hercules, in a fit of madness, killed his friend Ephytus, and was condemned for this offence to become the slave of Queen Omphale for three years. While in this service the hero's nature seemed changed. He lived effeminately, wearing at times the dress of a woman, and spinning wool with the handmaidens of Omphale, while the queen wore his lion's skin. When this service was ended, he married Dejanira and lived in peace with her three years. On one occasion, as he was travelling with his wife, they came to a river, across which the centaur Nessus carried travellers for a stated fee. Hercules himself forded the river, but gave Dejanira to Nessus to be carried across. Nessus attempted to run away with her, but Hercules heard her cries and shot an arrow into the heart of Nessus. The dying centaur told Dejanira to take a portion of his blood and keep it, as it might be used as a charm to preserve the love of her husband. Dejanira did so, and before long fancied she had occasion to use it. Hercules, in one of his conquests, had taken prisoner a fair maiden named Isle, of whom he seemed more fond than Dejanira proved. When Hercules was about to offer sacrifices to the gods in honour of his victory, he sent to his wife for a white robe to use on the occasion. Dejanira, thinking it a good opportunity to try her love spell, steeped the garment in the blood of Nessus. We are to suppose she took care to wash out all traces of it, but the magic power remained, and as soon as the garment became warm on the body of Hercules, the poison penetrated into all his limbs and caused him the most intense agony. In his frenzy he seized Lycus, who had brought him the fatal robe, and hurled him into the sea. He wrenched off the garment, but it stuck to his flesh, and with it he tore away whole pieces of his body. In this state he embarked on board a ship and was conveyed home. Dejanira, on seeing what she had unwittingly done, hung herself. Hercules, prepared to die, ascended Mount Ata, where he built a funeral pile of trees, gave his bow and arrows to Philoctetes, and laid himself down on the pile, his head resting on his club, and his lion's skin spread over him. With a countenance as serene as if he were taking his place at a festal board, 
he commanded Philoctetes to apply the torch. The flames spread apace and soon invested the whole mass. The gods themselves felt troubled at seeing the champion of the earth so brought to his end. But Jupiter, with cheerful countenance, thus addressed them. I am pleased to see your concern, my princes, and am gratified to perceive that I am the ruler of a loyal people, and that my son enjoys your favour. For although your interest in him arises from his noble deeds, yet it is not the less gratifying to me. But now I say to you, fear not. He who conquered all else is not to be conquered by those flames which you see blazing on Mount Eta. Only his mother's share in him can perish. What he derived from me is immortal. I shall take him, dead to earth, to the heavenly shores, and I require of you all to receive him kindly. If any of you feel grieved at his attaining this honour, yet no one can deny that he has deserved it. The gods all gave their assent. Juno only heard the closing words with some displeasure that she should be so particularly pointed at, yet not enough to make her regret the determination of her husband. So when the flames had consumed the mother's share of Hercules, the diviner part, instead of being injured thereby, seemed to start forth with new vigour, to assume a more lofty port and a more awful dignity. Jupiter enveloped him in a cloud and took him up in a four-horse chariot to dwell among the stars. As he took his place in heaven, Atlas felt the added weight. Juno, now reconciled to him, gave him her daughter Hebe in marriage. Chapter 2 Atlas and Hercules The river god Achilles told the story of Erisichthon to Theseus and his companions, whom he was entertaining at his hospitable board, while they were delayed on their journey by the overflow of his waters. Having finished his story, he added, But why should I tell of other persons' transformations when I myself am an instance of the possession of this power? Sometimes I become a serpent and sometimes a bull with horns on my head. Or I should say I once could do so, but now I have but one horn, having lost one. And here he groaned and was silent. Theseus asked him the cause of his grief and how he lost his horn, to which question the river god replied as follows. Who likes to tell of his defeats? Yet I will not hesitate to relate mine, comforting myself with the thought of the greatness of my conqueror, for it was Hercules. Perhaps you have heard of the fame of Dejanira, the fairest of maidens, whom a host of suitors strove to win. Hercules and myself were of the number, and the rest yielded to us too. He urged in his behalf his descent from Jove and his labours by which he had exceeded the exactions of Juno, his stepmother. I, on the other hand, said to the father of the maiden, Behold me, the king of the waters that flow through your land. I am no stranger from a foreign shore, but belong to the country, a part of your realm. Let it not stand in my way that royal Juno owes me no enmity, nor punishes me with heavy tasks. As for this man who boasts himself the son of Jove, it is either a false pretense or disgraceful to him if true, for it cannot be true except by his mother's shame. As I said this, Hercules scowled upon me, and with difficulty restrained his rage. My hand will answer better than my tongue, said he. I yield to you the victory in words, but trust my cause to the strife of deeds. With that, he advanced towards me, and I was ashamed, after what I had said, to yield. I threw off my green vesture and presented myself for the struggle. He tried to throw me, now attacking my head, now my body. My bulk was my protection, and he assailed me in vain. For a time we stopped, then returned to the conflict. We each kept our position, determined not to yield foot to foot, I bending over him, clenching his hand in mine, with my forehead almost touching his. Thrice Hercules tried to throw me off, and the fourth time he succeeded, brought me to the ground and himself upon my back. I tell you the truth, it was as if a mountain had fallen on me. I struggled to get my arms at liberty, panting and reeking with perspiration. He gave me no chance to recover, but seized my throat. My knees were on the earth, and my mouth in the dust. Finding that I was no match for him in the warrior's art, I resorted to others and glided away in the form of a serpent. I curled my body in a coil, and hissed at him with my forked tongue. He smiled scornfully at this, and said it was the labour of my infancy to conquer snakes. So saying, he clasped my neck with his hands. I was almost choked and struggled to get my neck out of his grasp. Vanquished in this form, I tried what alone remained to me, 
and assumed the form of a bull. He grasped my neck with his arm, and dragging my head down to the ground, overthrew me on the sand. Nor was this enough. His ruthless hand rent my horn from my head. The Naiades took it, consecrated it, and filled it with fragrant flowers. Plenty adopted my horn and made it her own and called it Cornucopia. Chapter 3 The Golden Fleece In very ancient times there lived in Thessaly a king and queen, named Athamas and Nephele. They had two children, a boy and a girl. After a time, Athamas grew indifferent to his wife, put her away, and took another. Nephila suspected danger to her children from the influence of the stepmother and took measures to send them out of her reach. Mercury assisted her and gave her a ram with a golden fleece, on which she set the two children, trusting that the ram would convey them to a place of safety. The ram vaulted into the air with the children on his back, taking his course to the east, till when crossing the strait that divides Europe and Asia, the girl, whose name was Hella, fell from his back into the sea which from her was called the Hellespont, now the Dardanelles. The ram continued his career till he reached the kingdom of Colchis, on the eastern shore of the Black Sea, where he safely landed the boy Phrixus, who was hospitably received by Aetes, king of the country. Phrixus sacrificed the ram to Jupiter and gave the golden fleece to Aetes, who placed it in a consecrated grove under the care of a sleepless dragon. There was another kingdom in Thessaly, near to that of Athamas, and ruled over by a relative of his. The king Aeson, being tired of the cares of government, surrendered his crown to his brother Peleas on condition that he should hold it only during the minority of Jason, the son of Aeson. When Jason was grown up and came to demand the crown from his uncle, Peleas pretended to be willing to yield it, but at the same time suggested to the young man the glorious adventure of going in quest of the Golden Fleece, which it was well known was in the kingdom of Colchis, and was, as Peleus pretended, the rightful property of their family. Jason was pleased with the thought, and forthwith made preparations for the expedition. At that time the only species of navigation known to the Greeks consisted of small boats or canoes hollowed out from trunks of trees, so that when Jason employed Argus to build him a vessel capable of containing fifty men, it was considered a gigantic undertaking. It was accomplished, however, and the vessel named Argo, from the name of the builder. Jason sent his invitation to all the adventurous young men of Greece, and soon found himself at the head of a band of bold youths, many of whom afterwards were renowned among the heroes and demigods of Greece. Hercules, Theseus, Orpheus, and Nestor were among them. They are called the Argonauts, from the name of their vessel. The Argo, with her crew of heroes, left the shores of Thessaly, and having touched at the island of Lemnos, thence crossed to Mysia, and thence to Thrace. Here they found the sage Phineas, and from him received instruction as to their future course. It seems the entrance of the Euxine Sea was impeded by two small rocky islands, which floated on the surface, and in their tossings and heavings occasionally came together crushing and grinding to atoms any object that might be caught between them. They were called the Simplegades, or Clashing Islands. Phineas instructed the Argonauts how to pass this dangerous strait. When they reached the islands they let go a dove, which took her way between the rocks and passed in safety, only losing some feathers of her tail. Jason and his men seized the favourable moment of the rebound, plied their oars with vigour, and passed safe through, though the islands closed behind them, and actually grazed their stern. They now rowed along the shore till they arrived at the eastern end of the sea and landed at the kingdom of Colchis. Jason made known his message to the Colchian king, Aetes, who consented to give up the golden fleece if Jason would yoke to the plough two fire-breathing bulls with brazen feet, and sow the teeth of the dragon which Cadmus had slain, and from which it was well known that a crop of armed men would spring up, who would turn their weapons against their producer. Jason accepted the conditions, and a time was set for making the experiment. Previously, however, he found means to plead his cause to Medea, daughter of the king. He promised her marriage, and as they stood before the altar of Hecate, called the goddess to witness his oath. Medea yielded, 
and by her aid, for she was a potent sorceress, he was furnished with a charm, by which he could encounter safely the breath of the fire-breathing bulls and the weapons of the armed men. At the time appointed, the people assembled at the Grove of Mars, and the king assumed his royal seat, while the multitude covered the hillsides. The brazen-footed bulls rushed in, breathing fire from their nostrils that burned up the herbage as they passed. The sound was like the roar of a furnace and the smoke like that of water upon quick lime. Jason advanced boldly to meet them. His friends, the chosen heroes of Greece, trembled to behold him. Regardless of the burning breath, he soothed their rage with his voice, patted their necks with fearless hand, and adroitly slipped over them the yoke and compelled them to drag the plough. The Colchians were amazed. The Greeks shouted for joy. Jason next proceeded to sow the dragon's teeth and plough them in. And soon the crop of armed men sprang up and, wonderful to relate, no sooner had they reached the surface than they began to brandish their weapons and rush upon Jason. The Greeks trembled for their hero, and even she who had provided him a way of safety and taught him how to use it, Medea herself, grew pale with fear. Jason for a time kept his assailants at bay with his sword and shield, till finding their numbers overwhelming, he resorted to the charm which Medea had taught him, seized a stone and threw it in the midst of his foes. They immediately turned their arms against one another, and soon there was not one of the dragon's brood left alive. The Greeks embraced their hero, and Medea, if she dared, would have embraced him too. It remained to lull to sleep, the dragon that guarded the fleece, and this was done by scattering over him a few drops of a preparation which Medea had supplied. At the smell he relaxed his rage, stood for a moment motionless, then shut those great round eyes that had never been known to shut before, and turned over on his side, fast asleep. Jason seized the fleece, and with his friends and Medea accompanying, hastened to their vessel, before Aetes the king could arrest their departure, and made the best of their way back to Thessaly, where they arrived safe, and Jason delivered the fleece to Peleus, and dedicated the Argo to Neptune. What became of the fleece afterwards we do not know, but perhaps it was found after all, like many other golden prizes, not worth the trouble it had cost to procure it. The end. This concludes Audiobookie's production of The Labours of Hercules, three short stories by Thomas Bullfinch. What did you think of this story? Let us know in the comments below. Please remember to like, subscribe and share our channel to spread literary greatness to the world. For Audiobookie, I'm Nigel Cairn. Thanks for listening. See you again soon.